Levitt. I'm a member of the executive committee of Conscience, which is the organization which is hosting this, what we hope will be the first of a series of discussions, debates, events, um, under our new campaigning slogan, Taxes for Peace, Not War. And the latest terrorist uh, uh, attacks, or would-be terrorist attacks, uh, in Britain and America um, have been either thwarted by good intelligence and police work, or have in fact been thoroughly pathetic. Now, why have they been so pathetic? Why, why have they failed? Well, one reason comes down to the very unglamorous, very unromantic, very undramatic, and very unmilitary work, seemingly unmilitary, Fertiliser. If you are a terrorist uh, without access to professional explosive materials and you want to make a really effective bomb, by far the best, what you really need is fertiliser. The great example of that was Oklahoma City, which was, of course, a, a crazed Christian something, American, not, of course, an Islamist one. And then he and his associates made this huge bomb out of fertiliser. Since then, what has happened? Our police forces have put in much stricter controls about getting your hands on fertiliser. You know, you have to prove that you're a farmer. You have to prove that you're a farmer. And it's probably not a good idea, I have to say this, to have a Muslim name. Um, and if you try, you will be reported to the police and exposed. Very unglamorous, pure police work, doesn't require invading Afghanistan or Iraq, but very effective when it comes to the basic, what I would say, the true definition of security for Britain, British governments, which is defending British lives. It doesn't require deploying an army to the other side of the world. Now, this brings me to an important, but perhaps not very popular point. Spend, spend is, in my view, by far the greater part of the time, better than kill, kill. I heavily paraphrase Churchill. However, I do think one needs to recognise, because it's easy to drift away into a rather naive version of international aid and how it contributes to security, that aid tailored to security is not always a very morally pure or pretty business. If aid is to be tailored to national security, which, by the way, I think the British people do expect to some extent, then it will involve both focusing on areas of security concern to Britain, which are, of course, not by any means necessarily the poorest or more miserable parts of the world, although they are poor and miserable enough, by God, if you look at parts of uh, Afghanistan, parts of Pakistan, other parts of the Muslim world. Secondly, though, it will inevitably involve dealing with a good many odious local regimes. It's not just a question of taking money from the Ministry of Defence and giving it to DFID, it could, to a certain extent, be a matter of folding DFID into the Ministry of Defence from the point of view of the ethics uh, and behaviour. Um, but um, if, as I say, uh, we are looking at using uh, development aid, as I believe we should to a great extent, as a substitute for military action, uh, then, um, in my view, uh, this we, we simply cannot go on uh, with the attitudes to aid and development pursued so far, to place it in one, no doubt a highly controversial word, I would say that this approach is decadent. I spent a lot of time trying to cost uh, the subsidies given to arms exports, and, and many of the reasons why government gives subsidies to um, arms companies are uh, the very same reasons as why the, the investment in the military is so high. Um, there's a... The, 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 they talk the talk when it comes to engagement and trying to overcome conflict globally, but in the end, it's still strategic competition that motivates, uh, deep down, uh, government priorities um, and status within the world. The new government, um, Conservative Liberal Democrat, well, you know, they exist uh, in the overwhelming uh, context of cutting funds. So that's the very first place to start. Um, they will undoubtedly cut the global pools, uh, which many of the organisations in our area will focus 
focused on. They may even cut them entirely. Conflict um, prevention pools. Conflict prevention pools. Uh, the money available, for, so the money available and the priorities in non-military security, I, I think undoubtedly will, will be reduced. Um, but, but, but equally, um, they're going to come under pressure to reduce um, okay. some, of these, um, some of these interventions. But by and large, all three main parties um, still subscribe to the concept of liberal intervention, military and non-military, with the concept of Britain playing a positive role for good in the world. And I don't see that changing. I see it being constrained. Um, I see them cutting back, um, but I don't see them changing. And, 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 and that has impacts in a number of different ways. But the, I'll just finish by talking about the nuclear impact. You know, I can imagine this country becoming a non-nuclear country in the next 10 years. I can imagine that. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I can imagine it. But if it does, I can only imagine it having just had a debate about how we can't afford it. And that would be the reason. It won't be for all the positive reasons that all of us, it'll be for money. It'll be because we can't afford two carriers and the, the tribal <laughs> submarines and keeping people in Afghanistan and there'll be all sorts of, you know, it, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that it's going to happen, I'm just saying if it does, that will be the reason. And that'll be bad. And it'll be bad globally because the message will be that Britain is a declining power and that if you're a declining power, you, use, you lose your nukes. And the other side of the coin is if you're a rising power, you need the nukes. So what, so what could otherwise be a huge opportunity to, deep, to, to reduce nuclear dangers and create a, a culture of moving away from nuclear weapons and building a strong global security based upon not threatening mass annihilation of one's potential enemies turns into a negative consequence. And that's why I think we, when we're campaigning on tribunal or, other, or any other issues, have to have a, an, an eye beyond the parochial to the impact on the global. It's, it's an unusual point which people may not have considered. But you know, in my view, by far the most practically effective institution institution in, in America today uh, opposing further military interventions is no, the uniform military. Uh, um, very interesting, last year of Bush when an attack on Iran with everything that would have come out of that seemed very, very likely. Who stopped it? First Admiral Fallon, chief of the combined staff, Bush sacked him. His successor, Admiral Mullen, did the, did the same thing, publicly opposed it. You can't go on sacking Irish admirals. You know, short <laughs> um, the, the, the military really, really doesn't want to get involved in the interventions. Of course, if God forbid America suffers another 9 11 or really serious attack, they may be dragged into it. But I think it's important to note, and it's not true in quite the same way in Britain, but in America, it is, you know, it's not the old pre 1914 or whatever model of, of you know, uniformed. Warmongers. It really isn't. You know, it was neocon civilians who created the Iraqi disaster. And of course, as long as the Americans don't charge off into something, but with the exception perhaps of you know relatively small interventions like Sierra Leone, we won't either, because we always follow. I mean, that's why we're there. We're following them. And so perhaps, touch wood. Uh, in fact, um, you know, the pattern of the last ten. Years, twelve years or so, um, is not going to be bad for the future, unless, as I say, America is attacked again and all that sort of conflict.